It's actually good to be back with you. Um, my wife, Carrie, and Carrie is right here. We've known this church, oh my, at least since 1990. And for over 10 years, this church was one of the supporting churches that helped us as we ministered in Japan. And so we have a, a, a great affection for you all. And in fact, some of you, I think, were here back then. So we're grateful for you. It is a pleasure to be back with you and open God's words. I'm excited for this study this morning. It was a pleasure preparing for this message. And I hope that it is not only encouraging to you and instructive, but that you actually delight in the word that we're going to be looking at this morning. Actually, before we look at the book of Philemon, I'm going to invite you to open your Bibles to Colossians chapter 1, please. Colossians chapter 1. And as you turn there, let me ask you this question. If the Lord were to answer your prayers about what kind of church you really want to be, and He were to do that right now, what would your church look like? If, if all of a sudden, instantly, the Lord were to give you every answer to your prayer to the dream of what this church, Hope Baptist Church, is going to be, what would it look like? Um, I, I was tempted to throw out, you know, have you answer, but, but I'm probably, pretty sure I know the answers that you might give, like Christ-centered, um, Spirit-led, Bible-oriented, energetic, filled with families of all ages, singing together loudly, glorifying Christ in your communities, discipling and raising up a new generation who, who loves Jesus follows Him and tells other people about the Lord Jesus. Caring for one another, meeting needs, forgiving one another, loving one another, praying with and for one another. Worshiping each Sunday morning genuinely from the heart. Is that the kind of church that you would dream about? And maybe you have a lot of other things. As we open the Word of God this morning, I want to encourage you to just be listening to what the Spirit has for you from the book of Philemon and, and from our time also, just a little bit in the Colossians. Because the Spirit does answer prayer. He wants to answer prayer. He wants Hope Baptist Church to be what you actually say, the, the, a living hope to the people here. Not just to the people here in these walls, but to the people out there in your communities. He wants this to be a beacon for the glory of Jesus Christ. To show people what, what changed lives look like. One of the things we do at our church, uh, we have our prayer meeting in different locations. One of the locations is at a house. And so on Wednesday nights, Carrie and I get to go over to this house in Grove City and we pray. But each night as we pray, what we do is we open the Word of God and we read the Word of God and we pray the scripture back to God. You're in Colossians chapter 1. Uh, would you follow along as I read verses 19 through 14? And then after I read, I will begin our time with prayer. Verse 9. And I apologize. Are we on? Okay. Okay. And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to His glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of His beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Would you pray with me, please? Our Father, we come to Your Word this morning. We give You thanks for Your revelation. And Lord, we would ask that You would help us all. Help this church, Hope Baptist Church, to be filled with the knowledge of Your will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Father, help us to walk in a manner that's worthy of You, our Lord. May we be fully pleasing to You. 
God, would you please bear fruit in our lives? Every good work and, and help us to increase in the knowledge of you, Lord. Father, may we be strengthened with your power. According to your glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. We give thanks to you, our Father. You have qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints with joy. God, I, I pray that you would help us to remember that we were delivered from the kingdom of darkness. God, you transferred us into the kingdom of your dear son, Jesus. You have given us redemption. You have forgiven us our sins. What a mercy. We continue to pray, Father, as we open the word of God this morning, that your spirit would have free course and that your word would do its work in bringing to our attention the areas that we need to change. Help us to be obedient to your word and to your spirit. Father, thank you for your glorious salvation. For the Lord Jesus Christ, help us to accurately and clearly reflect him and his glory. Not only as we gather together this morning here, but in the, the communities where you put us. Those are divine appointments. And we pray that your name would be lifted and that you would be honored this morning. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. My intention of reading this particular prayer, and there are many that we could have read, was intentional because uh, this text to the church at Colossae is related to the study this morning as we will be looking at the letter to Philemon. And that is because Philemon was a resident of Colossae. And... Uh, it's very interesting, the relationship between the letter to the Colossians and the letter to Philemon. And so I thought it was appropriate to read Paul's prayer for what the church should look like there in Colossae. Because it impacts, as, as we will be looking at the letter again, and just a little bit to Philemon. Stay in Colossians for the moment, one moment, though. We will be looking at the circumstances of this letter to Philemon. We'll be looking at the different character traits of, of Philemon, of his slave Onesimus, and then of the Lord Jesus Christ, and then hearing a, a challenge I think the Word of God has to us as the church. But here's the key theme, and, and just kind of remember this, because I, as we go into this lesson, this is what I want you to remember. We are to receive, we are to forgive, accept, befriend, and love other people in the way that Christ has received, forgiven, accepted, befriended, and loved us. In other words, as, as we deepen our understanding of the good news of the gospel, then we can have mercy, we can receive, and we can love other people. Isn't that tremendous? It's not something that I just have to generate and, and, and conjure up within myself. I can turn to the, the magnificent truth of God's mercy in my own life and on that basis I can turn to others who don't deserve mercy and show kindness and mercy and love so when I say that are any verses come to your mind about showing mercy or forgiveness to others in the way that we've been shown mercy or forgiveness I heard it Ephesians 4 32 that's, that's a really good one. And, and Ephesians 4.32, be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. That's a really good one. But because we're studying Philemon and really also Colossians, you're in Colossians. Look at chapter 3. Chapter 3. And I'd love to read more, but we're just going to look at verses 12 and 13. In verse 12 of Colossians 3, Paul says, Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if, if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, here it is, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. You see that? That is a theme in Paul's life. And as he has received mercy, he understands that's how he can show mercy and forgiveness to others. 
it's important that we deepen our understanding in the Word, in the Gospel in particular. And we remember that when God puts us divinely in, in, into the path of others who are not so friendly, and maybe that's a family member, maybe that's a co-worker, maybe that's a next-door neighbor, we can treat them with the same mercy and kindness that we've received. In fact, we're not, not only can we, we're commanded to treat them in the same way. Well, now you can open up to the little letter of Philemon. It's after the book of Titus. We're going to begin our study looking at verses 1 through 3, and I'm just going to give you the circumstances surrounding this letter. Philemon chapter, well, there's only one chapter. Uh, verse 1. Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. So the year was about 60, 61, 62 A.D. Paul's an older man now, and as he says here in verse 1, he is a prisoner. He is a prisoner in Rome. Having appealed to Caesar, now he finds himself all the way over in Rome. And um, the circumstances are, are really quite amazing, what happens in this letter. But um, this letter now is written to Philemon. He is a, a wealthy businessman there in the city of Colossae, as we said. And Paul's going to write this very tender, affectionate letter to him. Um, Paul is now in prison, but as a prisoner, he has people that have come to help him. And I, I didn't write this down, but just know this, that the pastor of the church at Colossae, his name was Epaphras. And earlier than this letter, he had left Colossae, traveled 1,300 miles all the way over to Rome to be with Paul and to minister to Paul's needs and to report on the condition of the churches in Colossae, Laodicea, and Hierapolis. There's three churches right there. Uh, Colossae is about 100 miles east of Ephesus. It's in modern Turkey. But just know this, 1,300 miles is a great distance, especially back then. And so Pastor Epaphras is now in Rome, and he reports on what's happening. But also what happens here is that Onesimus, who was the slave of this wealthy businessman, has stolen some money. And he has tried to slip away, and not just someplace nearby. He wanted to really get away. And guess where he goes? He goes 1,300 miles away to where he thinks he'll find complete anonymity. He will, he will find nobody knows him in Rome. 1,300 miles, slave Onesimus escapes. At least he thinks so. But by divine appointment, and I don't understand it, without, there's no GPS, there's no way to locate. In fact, he would not have wanted to locate the Apostle Paul. He was not a believer. He was an escaped slave who stole money. And yet God leads Onesimus in Rome to the Apostle Paul in prison. That's crazy. And what happens is the Apostle Paul shares the gospel with Onesimus. Onesimus now, his life is transformed. He receives the mercy of God. Jesus Christ forgives him. He becomes a new creation. And he is also staying there, very helpful and valuable to Paul. That's amazing. So, you have uh, some different people besides Epaphras now helping out. You've got at the end of this little letter in Philemon and also in Colossians 4, several names of people, and you can look at them later, who are there helping the Apostle Paul. You know some of those names like Luke, um, even John Mark. Okay? Okay. Um, one guy is an Asian believer. His name's Tychicus. He's over there helping out the Apostle Paul. And Paul now is saying to himself, all right, 
I love you, my dear son in the faith, Onesimus. But listen, you have violated Roman law and you have offended your master. I'm going to send you back 1,300 miles, but don't worry, I'm going to write a little letter for you on your behalf, appealing to Philemon for you. And that's what we have right here, the letter of Philemon. But remember, Epaphras, Pastor Epaphras, has also given a report about the church's condition in Colossae. Paul writes another letter almost at the same time, and it's what you know as the letter to the Colossians. That's why I read earlier from Colossians. And so the churches in Colossae didn't have a nice building like this. They didn't congregate all together from all the different places. They met in homes. And one of the homes they met in, as it says here in our, our, the first three verses, was in the home of Philemon. So Philemon had a group from the church at Colossae that met in his home. In Colossians chapter 4, we see that there was another lady businesswoman who had another group of the church at Colossae who met in her home. Okay? So this letter now is written to the church at Colossae. And Paul's going to say to another messenger, his name is Tychicus, the Asian believer. He says, Tychicus, you take this letter to the churches in Colossae and Laodicea. And here's what I want you to do, Tychicus. I want you to travel with Onesimus because he's a slave. And it would not be safe for him to travel again 1,300 miles in Roman territory because in the Roman Empire there were slave catchers. And their job was to find out if you're a slave or not and to return you to your master, and they get rewarded for that. So Tychicus traveled together with Onesimus from Rome, 1,300 miles back to Colossae, Tychicus carrying the letter to the churches at Colossae, and Onesimus carrying the letter to Philemon. Do you understand that background? Even if we stop there, friends, that, that's amazing. That is just, wow. God did all that, but it's not done. So you follow along with me as we continue then. We'll be looking at the different characters that are mentioned from verses 4 to 22. First of all, Paul's prayer and the character of Philemon from verses 4 to 7. So follow along with me as I read verses 4 to 7. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers, because I hear of your love, and he's Paul is writing to Philemon, I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in, the, that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. I didn't say this, but I should have earlier. The Apostle Paul has never been to Colossae, not one time. Yet he considers the church in Colossae one of his favorite churches, his my church. And why is that? It's likely that when Epaphras, the pastor and the founder of the church at Colossae, when he was in Ephesus during Paul's three-year ministry in Acts chapter 19, that Epaphras came to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul calls Epaphras, my, my beloved son. He also says that of Philemon, although he's never been to Philemon's house. He's never been to the church there. Paul calls Philemon, my beloved son. It's likely that as a businessman, he also was in Ephesus, about 100 miles from Colossae, on business, heard the word of God, and his life was miraculously transformed. Now they go back, and Epaphras founds the church in Colossae, a prominent member is Philemon. So I just, a little bit of a background there as well. So one of the things that, that Paul says to Philemon, he says, Philemon, I love you. I, you're, you're, you're amazing. God has done great things through you. And look what he says. Two characteristics of Philemon stand out there in verse 5. And that's his love and his faith. Uh, interestingly, the, the name Philemon, can you see part of that name? We get Philadelphia. His name means 
one who is affectionate or kind or loving. And it seems that he was a very friendly kind of guy. But please make no mistake, apart from the Lord Jesus Christ working in our lives, our love is for ourselves. We are very self-centered people. And we do not by nature love other people. But here he has a love for God's people, for the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And Paul commends him in verse 5. He says, wow, you have, you have such a love. And your faith, wow, it's amazing. Paul, or John says this in 1 John chapter 4, verses 7-12. through 12. These are the scriptures that came to my mind when I thought of what Paul says to Philemon. Beloved, let us love one another. Here it is. Love is from God. If there is a struggle in your life with the issue of love, whether it's with your spouse your children, your parents, siblings, love with extended family, love in your community, love within your church, love at work. Know this, that love is from God. And you cannot, by your own strength and effort, generate that love. You can try to be kind, but apart from the love of God in your, work, in your life and the gospel working in you and the Spirit of God, see, that is His fruit what is the first mention of his fruit? Church, what is the first mention of the fruit of the Spirit? Love. It is love. That is a fruit of the Spirit of God working in you. And that's what Paul is going to appeal to Philemon about. But so, let me come back to this. What do we learn as we, we hear about this letter to Philemon and, his, and who he is, his love and his faith in the Lord Jesus? It's not that it's about some self-improvement program. It's not some self-effort. But it comes from a deepening and growing understanding of the gospel and the word of God. That was the prayer to the, letter of the, to, to the church at Colossae. Who, by the way, or that, that letter, by the way, would have been read in Philemon's home as well. That Philemon and the church and his, that Aphia is his wife, Aphia is his wife, that the whole church would have a growing understanding, a deepening understanding of the Lord Jesus Christ and a knowledge of his will, that they would walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. So too. Church, Hope Baptist Church, you must deepen your understanding of the Lord Jesus Christ, of the gospel, of what he has done to save you. And it's not just for some future salvation to deliver you from hell. It is a gospel that is effective for you today. It teaches you how to live today. The grace of God teaches you to say no to sin. That's the book of Titus. It teaches you how to be kind to one another. This truth is borne out actually in verse 6 here. And I'm going to read it again from the ESV, but I will confess to you, I did not understand it. In verse 6, Paul says this, And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. And when I first read that, I thought, boy, this sounds really important. <laughs> what does it mean? Because in the ESV, and maybe some of your translations, it talks about the sharing of your faith with others. And that sounds a lot like evangelism. And at first I was prepared to say, boy, the more you evangelize and the more you share your faith with the lost mankind, the more you will deepen your understanding of the blessings you have. But as I began to research this more and look more, I don't think that's the intent. The word there for sharing is the word koinonia. And in the context, I, I, I thought, well, is there another translation? Somebody, someplace, somebody's done this a little bit differently. Let me read to you from the New English translation. See if it changes a little bit what you're, what you're hearing. Here it is from the New English translation. I pray that the faith you share with us 
may deepen your understanding of every blessing that belongs to you in Christ. And that seems to be, I like the focus here, not the focus on sharing the gospel with others and in doing so you will deepen your understanding of the blessings you have. But I think what Paul is saying is, Philemon, you and I, we share a common faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, in the Word of God. And as you deepen your understanding and set your roots deep in understanding the Word of God, you will become more convicted and more convinced of the reality of the blessings you have. And in doing so, you will be able to show mercy and love to others even more clearly. Does that make sense? Well, that's also instructive for us because we too are to deepen our understanding and our roots in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Some people are asked to share testimonies and, and their testimonies rightly are about what God did 10, 20, 30, 40 or more years ago. And that's okay. But you can share a testimony about what God did last week. You can share a testimony about how the gospel has impacted you yesterday. How it's helped you to, to make a right choice. Do you follow that? The gospel is living and it's for today as well. Paul gives another description of Philemon there in verse 7. I'll just mention it briefly. He says, Philemon, you are one who refreshes the saints. You are one who refreshes the saints. Now, I don't know about you. If somebody's asking you, what's, what's your spiritual gift? You might say, well, it's teaching or it's, uh, it's, it's mercy or whatever. But very few people would say, well, my gift is refreshing the saints. But this is a very special word. This is a military term. And the soldiers that were battle fatigued in the, in the brief lull between the battle, when they were able to get a little bit of rest, and they were able to get a, a, a sip of water and maybe a, a, a moment's sleep, that word is the word that's used here. And that was the kind of person that Philemon was. When you talked with him, you just went away thinking, oh, wow, you're strengthened, you're encouraged. I mean, there's some people you talk to and you're just sapped. They're just like, oh, man. But that was not Philemon. Philemon was the kind of person you just went away encouraged. Wow, that is the mercy of God. I can see it in his life. I can see it in my life. Well, imagine Hope Baptist Church being a place where, where those who come here, just weary of life, find refreshment. They find encouragement. And they go away and they're like, oh, wow, what's next? Isn't that the place you kind of want to be? There's so many people who are just weary. There's so many people who are broken. They need what your name says about you. They need hope. But it's not just hope in who you are. It's hope in the Lord Jesus Christ, isn't it? Well, next we come to Paul's plea. And we'll be looking at verses 8 through 16. Paul's plea and the character of Onesimus. So follow along, please, as I read verses 8 through 16. Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. I am sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be com by compulsion, but by your own accord. For this perhaps is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Wow. 
This is an amazing plea. What a, what a beautiful passage. In verse 10, notice that Onesimus is described as my child. I'm his father. Again, reminding us that it's, it's, it was likely Paul that led Onesimus to the Lord Jesus Christ. Onesimus ran away 1,300 miles, but God led him directly to where he could receive the gospel, to the Apostle Paul, who was imprisoned. And now, Onesimus, once slave to Philemon, has a new master, the Lord Jesus Christ. Onesimus' name, by the way, means useful. And so it's not without intention that, go back to verse 11. This is an intentional pun by the Apostle Paul. Look at verse 11. Formerly, he was useless to you. But now he is indeed useful to you and to me. Onesimus, whose name is useful, was useless to you. But now he's useful to me and to you. And then in verse 12, Paul says, I'm sending him back to you, Philemon, and I'm sending my very heart. As I began thinking about this, Onesimus was a man after God's own heart and the Apostle Paul's. Now, now friends, the Apostle Paul was a man after God's heart. But imagine being the kind of person that the Apostle Paul would say that of you as well. You know? He, she, after my own heart. What kind of person must Onesimus have become? As I think about this, I, I think, wow, Onesimus must have been somebody who loves the Lord Jesus Christ with all of his heart. And that was just evident. Onesimus must have become somebody who loves other people and with joy and with sacrifice serves other people. Onesimus must have become a prisoner for Christ. He knew that Jesus Christ was his Lord and Master. And so having become this kind of person by the grace of God, Paul says, he's my very heart. Receive him. I wonder if that would be said of us. That was very convicting for me as I was reading through this. By God's grace, may it be said of us. Imagine visitors checking out your church. And, and friends, I, I know some of you, there might be some visitors right here. I don't know. But imagine some visitors coming to check out your church and, and then going home and later that afternoon saying, wow, those people... They're just like, they're after God's heart. What a, what a neat statement. But I'm, I'm guessing that in reality, that would not be something that they would just observe in the confines of these walls right here. You know where that would be observed? That would be observed if you are the neighbor of that person and they have a need and you go across the street and you just say, hey, how can I help you? Or can I bring you a meal? We have a, I was just thinking, we have a neighbor that's been very calloused to spiritual things. And um, rough life, incredibly hard, tough woman. And um, you say hi to her and she, she might just, before she might just like grunt at you or something, you know. And she has little kids from different marriages and relationships and uh, about three weeks ago, I was out mowing the lawn, and I saw her arrive, and her son get out, got, gets out of the car, and he has crutches. And uh, I was like, Noah, what happened? Oh, broke my leg. I said, oh, playing sports? And mom walks over with her boyfriend, and for about 15 minutes, she starts talking. Never happens. And she said, I was in a serious car accident. Noah broke his leg. My 15-year-old, uh, her oldest, is over at Nationwide in, in ICU on life support. And she starts to tear up. Now, this is a tough, callous woman. And I said, can we pray for you? And she says, yes, please. Friends, you do not know 
the extent that God will take people through to get their attention. And you will not know unless you go out there and you obey and you just talk to people and you, you be and you live the life of Christ before others. Carrie was able to make meals for her and take them over. And, and she has, now you say hi, and guess what? It's no longer, hmm, or, or ignoring you. It's, hi. Now that's just one step. She's not saved. And so we continue to pray for her salvation. But you probably have people in your families, in your communities, at work, who are very similar. If the Lord Jesus Christ can reach into the life of a soul of Tarsus and change him, and friends, if he can change a Tom Zentz, he can change you. And he can change those that he brings you in, in contact with. Because that's what the gospel does. That's what mercy does. Jesus Christ will change you. But it's not just for your sake. It's so that you can be an ambassador to other people as well. Right? Well, we go on. Paul's plea to Philemon is also that he trusts in the sovereign God. Look what he says in verse 15. I just marveled at this. For this perhaps is why he, Onesimus, was parted from you, Philemon, for a while, that you might have him back. Period? What does your Bible say? Forever. No longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant, as a beloved brother, especially to me. But how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Already he was praised as a man of faith, but Paul takes another step and he says, listen, I want you to just stretch your faith a little more. I want you to understand that this was likely, perhaps, God's sovereign goodness. And what happened to you was unfair. You were robbed. You lost your slave. And we're not here talking about slavery today. This, that's another subject from this passage. But you lost, you were treated unjustly. Can we put it that way? We know what unjustness is and what it's like to be treated unjustly. You were treated unjustly. But here, just pause and think about this, Philemon. Maybe that was God's sovereign work in your life. Consider that. And consider what you're getting back now in return. More than a bondservant, but a brother forever. Trust that God's at work in your life and in the lives of others. And, and friends, that He is a good God. He is a good God. What a radical statement. What a bold statement, by the way. Think about this. He was a, Philemon was a wealthy businessman. He had this slave. He was probably well known in the community of Colossae. And there were certainly other businessmen and likely others who had slaves. Now, what if Philemon just said, well, you know what, forget it. Just, just, I'm not going to punish him. What would the pressure be from the community in Colossae on this businessman? Can't you imagine? It's like, what? You're not going to do anything? You know what? If you don't do anything, my slave will think about doing that. Come on, you've got to do something. I imagine that there was pressure from the community on Philemon to act. Well, I think because the letter of Philemon stands, and it was a personal letter to him and his family and the church there, I'm guessing that he did receive Onesimus. I mean, imagine if he didn't. Imagine if, if he would listen to those, the pressure and say, you know what, I'm not going to follow what Paul says. Do you think we would have the letter of Philemon in the, in the canon of Scripture today? I think somehow it would have been destroyed and somehow lost. But we have the canon of, in the canon of Scripture the letter to Philemon. So I think that he probably obeyed and followed what Paul said. But let me go on. What about this injustice? There was injustice. Does he just 
ignore it? Does Paul just ignore it and say, hey, for, you know, forgive and forget? I want to look at Paul's pledge and then the character of Christ in verses 17 through 22. So follow me in verse 17. So, if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, here it is, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it to say nothing of your owing me, even your own self. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will, even, you will do even more than I say. At the same time, prepare a guest room for me, for I'm hoping that through your prayers, I will be graciously given to you. Paul was so confident that Philemon would do this. He was like, hey, prepare a room for me. I, I'm, and he was confident that he would be leaving Rome, by the way, and that he would go back and finally visit the church he's never been to. Many uh, Bible scholars have drawn parallels between what we see here in this, in this section of Paul's plea to Philemon from Jesus' plea to God the Father. I mean, look at verse 17. Receive him as you would receive me. God who receives his son also receives us into his family. That is good news. That's great news. God receives sinners. And so when you are offended, when you are mistreated, when an injustice is done to you, you know what? You can just turn around and think immediately, God help me to remember that I have received mercy. I can be merciful. And sometimes it has to happen just like that, especially when somebody cuts you off in the highway, right? God, help me to be merciful. Look at verse 18. I, you know what? I, I just need to go back. Has God received you? Have you been received into the family of God? If, you, if, if so, your life is, is to be radically marked by by that forgiveness and that mercy. It's not to be hidden. It is to show up in how you treat others with the same mercy. And now we look at verse 18. Paul says this, Philemon, if he's done anything, and he has, if he's done anything, and he has, charge that to my account. These are powerful words. We have all wronged the Father. We have all raised our rebellious fist to him. We've said to him, I'm living my own life. We've all been sinners. And if you are in Christ, you have fallen at the mercy of God the Father because of what Jesus Christ has done. Because Jesus stands before the Father and he says, forgive him. Forgive Tom. Forgive Jonathan. Forgive Josiah. Yeah, they're guilty, except I've taken that payment. Charge it to my account in full, in full. There is no more debt to be paid. It is finished. That's good news. This church, the church of Jesus Christ around the world, it's to be a haven for people who need to hear that. For people whose lives are marked by brokenness. And God has come and he has brought forgiveness and mercy. And he has made them into new creations. And he has displayed them before a world that's lost and broken. And he says, this is what I do. I take lives that are messed up. I take lives that are in ruin. And I make them whole. And I give them peace. And I give them my full fruit, the whole fruit basket of the Spirit. 
That's what Hope Baptist Church is about. You bring a living hope to people who need it. And it's all on the basis of the mercy and grace and the love that has been showered on us. Let me just uh, continue with this. He finishes out this section <clears throat> with a challenge, I think, to the church. Um, I wasn't going to focus on this, but I'll just bring it to your attention quickly. There's a list of characters at the end of this letter. Take a look at that. One of them, verse 23, he mentions Epaphras. That's the pastor. Now he calls him the fellow prisoner in Christ. Uh, sends greetings to you. And so do and do you have Mark listed in your scriptures? Do you remember that this same Mark, cousin of Barnabas, is the person, the very person that Paul says, I don't want him. I don't want him in the ministry. I don't want him traveling with me, Barnabas. He's no good. He's not fit. He's a yellow belly chicken. That's what I want. He's, a, he's a coward. I'm not taking him. And those words became so harsh that Barnabas and the Apostle Paul separated ways. And Barnabas, the son of encouragement, took his cousin with him and ministered alongside him. And Paul went his own way. And yet right here, we understand that somewhere in this, the Apostle Paul recognized God is continually working in the hearts of people. And I think it was with a lot of humility that he had to include Mark here. And he understands that with the same mercy that he has received, he is to extend mercy even to people that maybe don't deserve it. Colossians chapter 4, John Mark's also mentioned there. John Mark became a very valuable asset to the Apostle Paul. We have one of our Gospels because of this man and God's work in his life. Well, the challenge to the church, Martin Luther put it this way. We are all Onesimuses. In other words, we're all useful for the Lord. All who follow Christ first came to him as a, a rebel sinner. Trying to flee. But God found us. God found us. He rescued us. He showered us with His mercy and grace. And that whole good news of His forgiveness and mercy, through Jesus Christ, He says that is the basis of your salvation and that is the basis for your ministry in building my kingdom. You are useful for the Master's work. Don't let the enemy make you think otherwise. Satan would make you think you are a failure. You are not consistent. You really can't do this work. This is greater than you. And you know, sometimes Satan's arguments, they're based partly on truth. But we have an advocate that stands before the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, who says, Father, charge that to my account. He's forgiven. Continue using his, Him, and, and He prays for us. He prays for you. And I would encourage you, church, to deepen your understanding of this truth, the gospel of Jesus Christ, to stand firm on it, to not listen to the lies of our enemy, to shine as a beacon for the glory of Jesus Christ, of what He does in the lives of broken people. And not just within these walls, but especially in the places divinely ordained for you. Because I can't be in the places where you are at. And you can't be in the places where I'm at. And that might be your family, your neighborhood, your co-workers, communities. But this is to be a place of hope for those around you, for the glory of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, the task is amazing. 
Your work of building your kingdom is, is beyond beautiful. But it is a work. And it's one that's not without an enemy. And Father, I pray that you would help us to set our sights more deeply on you. To love you more. To understand your word and, and the truth of your, of your word. God, help us to, to make decisions that would be, be pleasing to you live lives that are worthy of you.